Well, good evening and welcome to those of you who are joining on Zoom. This is Chosen People Ministry UK's Tuesday night Bible study. And we've been going through the book of uh, Genesis and hopefully seeing if the rabbis can shed some understanding on things we've known and understood for many years. Um, as we continue to explore the book of Genesis together, Last week, we looked at Adam and Eve's choice to disobey the one negative command that the Lord God had given them, and that was not to eat from one, just one of the trees in the garden. They could eat from the tree of life, but they were not to eat from the, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, as we know from our, the narrative, they do. And Adam and Eve blame and accuse one another, and ultimately they lose the blessing. Instead of paradise, instead of that incredible fellowship they had with the Lord God, they're going to experience pain and hardship. But what strikes me in this, this narrative is that God, in the midst of all of this pain and tragedy, provides hope. It comes in the form of a prophecy which will contain the gospel. But first, I think we need to explore in a little bit more depth the sins they committed. Each of the, the protagonists in this uh, narrative and the account of the fall of man will be judged and will pay a price for this sin of rebellion. Now, last week, I finished by saying that the first thing they understood as a result of eating from the tree the fruit of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil was shame. And with shame came fear. They understood their nakedness and the shame of it. And for the very first time, because of that, fear entered into the hearts of human beings. They knew what was, was going to come. They knew what was going to happen because they had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now the knowledge of sin and the consequences of sin had entered into their hearts. When I was doing the research for this, I came across a really fascinating study, which looks at all of the commands that they had broken with a particular focus on the Ten Commandments. I tweaked a little bit, but basically this is uh, adapted from their study. And of course, the first sin was that of disobedience. They disobeyed the one negative directive command that they should not have done. They ate from the forbidden fruit. And remember that the lie, we talked about the lie in the garden last week, the lie that Satan spoke was, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. And that was in Genesis uh, 3, verse 5. And of course, in Genesis, uh, sorry, in Exodus 20, verse 3, as part of the Ten Commandments, we read, you shall have no gods before me. They were putting themselves as gods before God, the Lord their God. And in doing so, they dishonored their heavenly Father. Well, Again, in the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, verse 12, it says, honor your father and your mother. Paul makes a comment about this in Romans 1, 21, where he says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Perhaps the next sin was that of covetousness. Exodus 20, verse 15. They wanted what they did not have. They wanted to be like God. So perhaps not only did they covet something which they did not have, there was the sin of greed. You see, God said he'd given them everything in the garden. In fact, he'd given the whole earth. He'd given them the trees and the vegetation for food and for fruit. Still, they wanted more. It wasn't enough. Perhaps we could also say it was a sin of theft. And we know that in the Ten Commandments, in verse 15 of Exodus 20, it says, you shall not steal. Now, here's an interesting one, and I hadn't thought of this. Um, they committed murder. 
Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not kill. Through their sin and the choice that they made, death becomes the inheritance that they will pass on to all mankind. Through one man, sin and death entered into human existence. There's another thing I noticed, and that is that Adam was not thankful for the woman that God had given him. He blamed her for his sin, and she in turn blamed the snake. But Adam went further when he blamed God. And we read in Genesis 3 verse 12 in our chapter, the man said, the woman, yes, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Well, perhaps if we think about Rav, the apostle Paul Rafshul, we might say that he failed in his, the call of a husband to sacrificially love his wife. Ephesians 5.25 records the instruction, husbands love your wives as Messiah loved the church and gave himself up for her. Well, what did Adam do? Instead of sacrificing himself and loving sacrificially, he sacrificed her and as it were, threw her under the bus. Meanwhile, don't forget that when the snake approached Eve, he stood idly by and watched. The rabbis, of course, suggest that he wanted to know if she would really die. And so he watched to see if she ate it would be okay, and then it would be safe for him to eat it. Hmm. I better make no more comment on that one. In Genesis 3 verse 6, we read that she took of the fruit and ate, and also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now, when God called Adam first, perhaps it's because God holds him ultimately responsible. But when God questions Eve, she said it was the snake's fault. And this is why I called it the blame game. And here for me is the surprising moment. And it's this, in having eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now, from the other side of history, they know what is right and they know what it's wrong from God's perspective. And what surprised me is they didn't repent. They didn't say sorry. Now, Ralph Shaul has something to say about this. Again, in Romans, the Apostle Paul, in Romans 1, verse 8. And towards the end of the verse, he writes, men, and women for that matter, who by their own unrighteousness suppress the truth. Eve had been seduced for, her, for the desire for wisdom. And we can read in the scripture, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. Then of course they broke the very first commandment that was given in scripture. They failed in the stewardship of the earth. And I think when we read Genesis 1, we can see that Adam and Eve were created to be the stewards of the earth. So let's go back and read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, the life in the garden wasn't one of leisure, but neither was it to be one of hardship. You see, God had given them a commission, a divine calling, and that was that they would share in God's rule over the earth. And the Lord had given them everything they would or could ever need. We read in Genesis 1, continuing in verse 28 through to verse 38, and I'm not going to read all, just little snippets from it. Um, and he says, and God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You, you shall have them for fruit and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath, I have given every green plant for food. But when they sinned, it seems to me 
that there were very deep and profound consequences for all of humanity. So I'm going to read from Genesis 3, from verse 13. And let's have a quick look and a run through of the consequences of their sin. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all of the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children and your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust shall you return. And then you have a little touch of God's mercy, where the Lord said, the Lord uh, made for Adam and for Eve garments of skins and clothed them. They had previously made themselves garments and coverings from the leaves. So let's go back and just have a quick review. What are the consequences of sin? They would now experience pain and hardship. They would lose Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, and they would be banished as a result. Childbirth would become painful. And although it's not stated, I think it's fair to assume that this was part of the judgment of God because she listened to the serpent. Life with her husband would lose the equality that it had been given by God. And now the husband would rule over her. Men would farm the earth and it would produce thorns and thistles. And this would be hard work. And this was the judgment of God for listening to Eve and not to him. And ultimately, even the ground is cursed. Even the earth is tainted by the sin of humanity. Now let's look at the bit that gets really interesting, and that's the judgment upon the snake. Now, to this day, the snake is the most reviled creature on earth. When we think of something nasty and slippery and slimy, we think of a snake, even when a lot of them are actually quite dry to the touch and scaly. Um, but what's fascinating to me is that here is the gift of the gospel. Here is God's greatest act of love and mercy to deal with the tragedy of human sin and the loss of fellowship with God and the loss of eternity. This verse is known as the Proto-Evangelium. It's known be this way because it it represents the first proto and evangelion proclamation. So the first proclamation, and it's the proclamation of the gospel, of course. Now, inevitably, there are there is dissent among theologians about whether this is, in fact, a messianic prophecy or whether it's simply the etiology of human misery that human misery is a result of sin, and it will completely overlook this as a messianic prophecy. However, if we see the Tanakh, the Old Testament, as one book with many authors written over many centuries, we can say that the Old Testament provides us with an unveiling or an ongoing revealing of God's plan for mankind and his redemptive plan to restore what had been lost in the Garden of Eden and prepare us for the eternal garden, the eternal paradise that God has prepared for all who will take hold of his offer of salvation provided by his son, Yeshua. This is what is known as progressive revelation where the recognized messianic prophecies build up for us a picture of who the Messiah will be and what he will do 
on behalf of humanity and how he will sacrificially lay down his life. This means that in order to understand Genesis 3.15, we need to read it not in isolation, but to allow the rest of scripture to shine a light on it. So let's read that prophecy again. Here we have God's judgment. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Now, the first time I read this as a young believer, I wondered what on earth it really meant. And I'm sure that while we have all subsequently drawn conclusions from all of the teaching that we may have heard and our own reading and study over the years, I'd like to share a few thoughts of mine along with a little Jewish perspective on this. I was at a seminar today by, led by Brian Crawford. Um, I'm sure that you're aware of this, and if you're not, I'm going to back to make you aware that studies show that Jewish people are falling into two camps. They're either becoming secular or they're becoming ultra orthodox. In other words, the middle ground, traditional conservative reform, liberal Judaism is shrinking while there is huge growth in the secular Jewish community, those who are culturally Jewish, but not have any faith in God, not religious, and then the Orthodox. Now, often we call the ultra Orthodox, the Haredim. And what's really interesting is their birth rate is increasing while the birth rate among ordinary Jewish families is decreasing. And we reckon that within 30 years and maybe less, the Haredi will be the dominant form of Judaism in our country. Brian gave us a really interesting seminar and he was showing us how um, a worker in the 1890s said that we need more than one tract to reach Jewish people. We need tracts that are for the Hasidim. We need tracts for those who are um, Chabad who follow Kabbalah. We need tracks for this kind of Judaism, for that kind of Judaism. And Brian said, well, this is a call for one kind of tract. We don't need a million tracts anymore because Jewish people will either fall into one of two camps, secular or very, very religious. And we need to know how to speak to them. So it was very fascinating. And when we give in a Bible study like this, a Jewish perspective, we're tending to think about those perspectives that date from usually prior to the Middle Ages that are leaning on the Talmud and the Mishnah and thoughts that come out of Second Temple Judaism. The kind of thinking that the writers of the New Testament would have known about. Now that's a valid understanding for us, but it may not make much sense to the Jewish people. So this is not an apologetic on how to witness to Jewish people from this text, because the fr frankly, if we talk about progressive revelation, the Jewish people have their own progressive revelation. And they interpret scripture in the light of the ongoing revelation of the rabbis. Now, when we stand on sola scriptura, the word of God alone is our, our guide from revelation at the end to genesis at the beginning backwards and forwards and we stay that's where we want to stay we want to measure everything we say according to the written word of god that we have in the pages of our bibles jewish people consider torah the law of moses the first five books of the bible as torah but then they consider the whole of the old testament as torah and then they consider the whole of the talmud as Torah, and then they consider some of even the contemporary Jewish uh, writings as Torah as well. In other words, their authority is not the books of scripture alone, but all of the writings of all of the rabbis over all of the centuries. And that means that when we speak to Jewish people about these scriptures, and we talk about uh, some of the stuff I'm going to share, it means nothing to them because they don't know it, but it might add just a little bit of 
understanding and richness to what we know from our scriptures when we focus on scriptura sola. In other words, the word of God is the word of God and it's contained from Genesis to Revelation and everything else is commentary. And I'm, I'm, and while I love to quote the rabbis, I only quote them if I think they help me understand or help you understand, or they've informed my view and I'm sharing it. So let's have a look and see if the rabbis have anything helpful to contribute to this particular prophecy. And for this, I'm indebted to a little book that I first read, oh, 30 years ago, when I first joined Messianic Testimony, and it was one of the first books that uh, I was given off the bookshelf. And Rachmiel Friedland uh, wrote a book called, oops, it's under my hair, what the, what the Rabbis Know About the Messiah. Fascinating little book, really is. And um, he notes that the rabbis from past centuries considered the Messiah to be the center of the whole creation. Now, I remember way back in my first study, I looked at how Messiah uh, was evident in the light by which God created. So there was evening and there was morning the first day. The sun and the moon hadn't yet been created, but there was evening and there was morning. There was light and there was darkness. So where was the light from? And I believe it's because Yeshua, the lamp of heaven, was the light by which God created. And the rabbis themselves believe that the light was the light of King Messiah. And interestingly, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but when the spirit of God hovered over the waters in Genesis chapter one, that's also considered to belong to the Messiah. By the way, the word for spirit there is Ruach. And we know that Ruach is the spirit of God, but it's the translation is the breath of the wind of God. And I thought I'd share with you a couple of quotes from the Talmud that demonstrate the view that the spirit of God here that hovers over the water is the spirit of Messiah. And the spirit of God hovered over the waters, that is the spirit of King Messiah. Found another verse that's really interesting. This is the wind of the King, the Messiah, as it is written. The spirit, which comes from the same verb or noun root as the wind of the Lord. In other words, the wind or the breath of God here, according to the rabbis, is the breath or the wind of King Messiah. I thought that was fascinating. Um, so, but then, and the reason why I quote it is because then they do something really, really interesting that completely bowled me over when I first discovered this. They connect the wind of God in Genesis chapter one with the spirit of God in Isaiah chapter um, 61 where we read, and the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. What the rabbis say about this is that humanity will only know true wisdom, unlike that that um, Eve sought when she believed Satan's a lie. What they believe is that through the spirit of Messiah, humanity will gain true wisdom, the true wisdom of God that comes from the spirit of Messiah when in the messianic age. And I thought, wow, isn't that really amazing? I wonder if they've read the New Testament. Well, we know that they haven't. But what they're saying is something that we can see when we look at the gospel of john in john 15 26 yeshua says this but when the spirit so when the helper comes whom i will send to you from the father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father and he will bear witness about me or further on in john chapter 16 verses 7 to 13 i won't read all of it but i'll read some snippets nevertheless i tell you the truth 
For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness. He goes on to say, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So that's really, really interesting. The rabbis believed that the true wisdom of God would come in the era of King Messiah because the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. And, and the rabbis are connecting the dots for us here. But let's get back to the prophecy in Genesis 3, verse 15. Friedland notes that Adam and Eve's misguided challenge to the uniqueness of God's authority had to be punished. However, along with the punishment comes the blessing and promise to humanity. The woman, the first to abase herself before Satan, is told that from her seed would come the one who would bruise the head of the serpent, whom Satan had used to mislead humanity. According to this prophecy, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. In other words, the seed of the woman is going to deal a fatal blow to the head of the serpent. And the seed of the woman would in turn sustain a bruise to the heel, not a fatal blow. Now there's an Aramaic paraphrase of the Hebrew scriptures called the Targum uh, Jonathan. And he relates this prophecy to the Messiah. And he says this, talking about the offspring of the woman, not the offspring who's gonna bruise the head, but all of the future children of Eve. And he said this, but they, that is, all of the future children of Israel, will be healed in the footsteps of the days of King Messiah. And the interesting thing is the Aramaic translation for bruise carries the sense of rubbing with medicine and so of healing. Another of the great commentators from the 12th to 13th century, David Kimchi, he also gave support to the idea in this scripture that the prof this is a prophecy about Messiah's redemption of mankind. And he recognized that the salvation to come is by the hand of the conquering Messiah who would wound the head of Satan, who is the king and the prince of the house of the wicked. Now, I'm about to jump forward to the next chapter, chapter four. And although I said we're really doing a study in chapter three, you have to conclude the study with the first verse of um, chapter four. In Genesis chapter four, Eve makes a declaration and it's rather surprising. Now it might be said, considering that her punishment from God was that childbirth would be painful it would perhaps not be difficult, but perhaps not surprising to say that when she speaks this word, this declaration, she's simply grateful that God helped her to give birth. So in Genesis 4, chapter 1, she says, now, well, we read that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And she says this, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Did she mean more than simply she gave birth to a son and she didn't have a midwife? She only had the help of God. Well, the rabbis would say, mm, that's not a, a good enough answer. They ask, because they love to ask the question, did Eve see her son as the seed who would deal the fatal blow to Satan, the evil serpent, who had deceived her and her husband? and led to the tragic loss of the blessings of living in the presence of the living God, their heavenly father. 
the rabbis believe that she's making a messianic proclamation as well. That she believes that the verse indicates that she expected more than an earthly child. And that her explanation means that she believed that God had literally fulfilled the promise. Well, that's presumably until Cain kills Abel and the expectations of the promised seed are dashed. However, further down in the chapter, she says the same thing again, or something slightly similar. In verse uh, 25 of chapter 4, we read, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called him Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. Of course, there is a linear edge here because Seth is the ancestor of Abraham to whom the messianic promise is reiterated. And Paul in Galatians will give us this explanation. Galatians 3 verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is the Messiah. Now, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Paul tells us this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all of the people, because all had sinned. He expands this thought in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse, I'm going to read from verse 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. How does Adam become a living being? Because God breathed the breath, his ruach, into them and they became living beings. In other words, they inherited eternal life at the moment that God breathed into them. They came more, they're more than the animals because Adam and Eve, human beings alone, carried the breath, the ruach, the spirit of God within them, uniquely created to be bearers of the image of God. Let's continue. Paul continues then by saying, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So the first man was a living being because God made him alive by his spirit. But the last Adam, meaning Jesus, becomes a life-giving spirit because he will give the spirit who gives life. How are we born again? We're born again because we're born of the spirit of God. Now, Paul continues by saying, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then comes the spiritual. The first man was from earth, a man of dust, and God in his judgment said, unto dust you will return. The second man, Jesus, is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. That's you and me and all human beings. And as the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Aha! Who are those of heaven? Is Paul talking about the heavenly beings or is he talking about what he's about to say in the next verse? Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. If we bear the image of the man of heaven, the image of Jesus, the character of God formed in us, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. When we are born again, God sets about restoring his image in us and we become bearers of the image of the man of heaven, that is Jesus. So now we've, what we've done is we've come full circle back to Genesis 3.15. God created mankind, Adam and Eve were living beings because he breathed his very breath, his ruach into them. But because of their sin, death entered mankind. Now Jesus, the man from heaven, comes to deal not only with sin in his sacrifice, but he deals with the loss of eternity and the loss of the blessing 
that Adam and Eve had with God, intimate fellowship. This is the blessing of bearing the image of the man of heaven within us. We bear his image when we're born again, when the spirit of God transforms us, one, by the renewing of our minds, two, by being renewed in the knowledge of God, three, by forming the character of God by the fruit of the spirit. And the fruit of the spirit is nothing more and nothing less than the character of God, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control. We're describing the very person of Jesus. And that is what God wants to give to us through the fruit of the spirit to make up for, very sadly, our own deficiencies in character. The fruits heal our character. The fruit of the spirit transforms us so that the image of God can once again be seen in us as we bear the image of the man from heaven. And so I decided many years ago that like the rabbis, I believed that this was a messianic prophecy. But growing up in the Brethren Assembly, I'd been told this was a messianic prophecy. I didn't understand it then as a 14 year old. It took me a few years to come and to grapple with it. But I did find 30 years ago when I first met Red Rachmil Friedland that I found it really helpful to understand how the rabbis see it and how Jewish people probably in the days of Paul and the writers of the New Testament and the Jewish people who lived in those days understood these things because the Talmud represents a very ancient second temple understanding. I hope I haven't confused you too much. We'll have a, for the, sorry for those of you who are online, you're not party to our discussion, but uh, you could always write into uh, info at chosenpeople.org.uk if you have questions that you'd like an answer to and our office will forward them to me and hopefully I can um, write back to you. I'm going to close our Bible study and we're gonna have a time of discussion. Thank you for tuning in and listening to our Tuesday Bible study at Chosen People Ministries UK.